Yeah, my name is Nate Crosser. I am the Startup Growth Specialist at the Good Food Institute. And over the next 20 minutes, I will provide a primer on the production processes for the alternative dairy products of the future, and then end with a little bit on the kind of state of the alternative dairy market with a couple of projections for the future. Just very briefly, for those not yet familiar with my organization, the Good Food Institute is a nonprofit that is dedicated to accelerating the shift to a healthy, sustainable, and just food system. We employ over 100 in staff in six countries across three key program and act departments. First is, is science and technology, second is corporate engagement, and third is policy. And in essence, we act as an accelerator and think tank for the supply side of the alternative protein industry so that companies can create meat, eggs, and dairy products that uh, appeal to consumers but are just produced in a better way. And so how do we produce those products that people want in a better way? The solution is what we call alternative proteins, which GFI puts into, and I think most others put into three broad categories. The first is uh, products made from plants. The second is those enabled by uh, or, or derived via fermentation. And the third is by cultivating animal cells directly. And I'll go more in depth into those in turn. So the first and most developed category of alt dairy is plant-based. And the core brainstorm here is that we can give people what they like about animal-based dairy, just using uh, plant-based ingredients. And these products already make up over 14% of US retail dollar milk sales. There's two standard approaches to making plant-based milk. And in the interest of time, I won't go into them, uh, but I will make this deck available if anyone wants to look at these diagrams. So this slide describes the first approach where we work directly with whole legumes, grains, nuts, and seeds. Uh, and, and in this approach, we use the plants naturally, keep them intact, and, and they ultimately play an important role in the structure of the product. And the second approach uh, for making plant-based milk is without the use of whole legumes, grains, nuts, or seeds. And it's based on making an emulsion out of water in a plant-based oil, then reconstructing the fat globules from, from plant sources to, to replicate milk, flat, milk fat globules. Uh, this is mostly relies on, on homogenation technology. So let's look at the, the number one differentiator in terms of plant-based dairy, which is the plant species predominantly being used in the product. There are four main categories for making plant-based milk. Uh, the first being legumes like soy and pea. Soy, as we uh, know, has for a long time been used to make plant-based milks, and pea is, is one of the main up-and-coming sources, and a huge benefit of legumes is their super high protein content. Second is grains, which are also coming up in a big way. Uh, and you know, oat milk has grown significantly over the past few years, especially, and uh, rice milk, which, uh, you know, w existed kind of in obscurity for a while, is growing in popularity because uh, some of the solubility issues associated with, with rice milk have been solved in the last few years. So we're seeing that, that more and more on shelves. Uh, seeds are an interesting source because you can not only use them for the protein, but also the oil present, uh, which, you know, helps uh, leading to better cost and unit economics when creating, creating the milks. And then when, when it comes to nuts, almonds obviously lead the way, uh, but we're seeing growth in cashews, peanuts, and coconut is the, the base ingredient. And then lastly, blends of various crops are, are more and more being used to complement each other's nu nutrient profile and, and functionality. As I mentioned, almond king, almond milk is king in the U.S., but oat milk is rapidly growing. Uh, as you can see in U.S. retail in 2019, uh, oat grew at uh, nearly 700%. And there are many opportunities for innovation with new plant-based sources like uh, lupin, quinoa, canola, oat, uh, uh, potato, peanut, and then many others that are not listed on this diagram like amaranth, millet, sesame, spelt, hemp, lotus flower, chestnut, uh, et cetera. You know, there's, there's tens of thousands of plant species that, that can be explored and optimized for, for plant-based milk applications. So zooming in on a couple really quickly, the first is oat, the hottest plant-based milk ingredient. And uh, this is, I, I think, largely driven just by marketing improvements by Oatly, which is a Swedish company that formed in the 1990s, but is now you know, one of the, the most popular plant-based milk brands. Oat is used for its high protein content, uh, low allergenicity, good flavor. It foams really well. So it's very functional in things like lattes. And then there's kind of this health novelty and sustainability halo around oat that, that certain things like soy don't, don't have. 
Chickpea is also rapidly emerging due to its versatility and functionality. Uh, there are a, hand a handful of startups that are kind of pioneering the use of chickpea as a functional ingredient, including Israeli Novo Pro, which raised $20 million in venture capital so far. I would expect to see more, more chickpea milks uh, and, and dairy products on the market in, in the coming years. So just uh, very, very briefly on pea using uh, Ripple's kind of flagship milk is an example, just to highlight the, the, the health benefits of, of plant-based milk. So if you look at the, the nutrient panel on Ripple, you'll see that it has pretty much the same protein content as animal-based milk, but half the fat uh, and half the sugar, fewer calories and more calcium. So just a great example of what we can do uh, with, with pea protein. So zooming back out, I think of plant-based milk as coming in three waves. The first is kind of this, this wave of staples, you know, legacy brands like Oatly, Silk, and Dream that are predominantly almond, soy, and, and oat products that make up the vast majority of, of current sales. But we do really have a ton of activity in this kind of new wave of, of kind of novelty milk products. So those are those exploring new plant sources for the unique functionality like pea with, with Ripple that I just talked about, banana, chickpea, lupin, some of the other things that I talked about, including those, those blended products. And um, just seeing, seeing you know, a ton of activity here, probably the, the most active uh, of, of the space. And then the kind of third wave is this biomimicry approach. So the idea that we can create plant-based milks that can replicate the sensory and, and functional experience of say cow's milk just with plants. And there are really only a few startups that are working on this, namely uh, Eclipse Foods, which, which uh, has direct consumer ice cream lines. Um, there, there are others. And then the, the big kind of player that has recently gotten, I think, into this uh, strategy is Impossible Foods, which maybe about a month ago announced that its new products were, were going to be steak and milk. And I imagine their milk is, is going to be a biomimicked milk. And, and, I, and I don't put them in these waves to, to indicate that, you know, um, that soy and oat are going to be outdated or that the, the novelty products are going to be niche, but just that they have a slightly different value proposition than, than say, those uh, biomimicking uh, animal milk. So who is making this stuff? The, the top selling brands, at least in U.S. retail, are a mixture of legacy vegan brands, large corporate subsidiaries, and emerging alt-protein companies selling a variety of products. So the, the top brands in milk are quickly Blue Diamond, Calivia Farms, Dream, Good Karma, Oatly, Planet Oat, Pacific Foods, Ripple, Silk, and, and So Delicious, which are, are all pretty much household names at this point. A little bit more obscure are the top selling brands in cheese, some of which I'm sure you're familiar with or even uh, a little consternated with. Uh, Daya, Field Roast, Follow Your Heart, Go Veggie, Kite Hill, Lisnati, Miyoko's, Tofuti, Treeline, and Fire Life. Uh, Probably more importantly, there are literally hundreds of startups developing new products. As this uh, Kind Earth Tech graphic shows, it's really impossible to keep up. This is probably, you know, two months old and already radically outdated. And, and startups are able to innovate more rapidly and pursue more niche or riskier strategies or formulations than large corporations and are thus uh, likely to be the, the first mover in nearly all categories. We saw it in plant-based milk already with brands like Silk. And then, in, you know, uh, biomimicked beef burgers with brands like Impossible Foods, Beyond Meat, Corn, which were all at some point uh, startups. And we're now seeing the, the same pattern in emerging categories like ice cream, butter, spreads, eggs, and obviously many meats that are beyond the scope of this, this uh, talk. And the competitive landscape goes well beyond these kind of legacy vegetarian brands and startups. The, the biggest players in the, the meat and food industry have taken notice. So of the top six food and beverage companies in the world, all of them are active in plant-based meat or dairy. I don't, I don't have it segmented uh, either through their own product lines or investments. And of the, uh, all the alternative protein products, refrigerated plant-based milk has the highest household penetration in the US with nearly 40% of US households buying plant-based milk. Uh, compare that to plant-based meat, 14% of households are purchasing, and cheese, only 3% of households are purchasing. Uh, you know, although they're already relatively high, I expect that, that these penetration numbers are going to go up drastically as, as new products are rolled out. And the main driver behind milk being the number one plant-based category 
is because it is the only one that's really consistently merchandised with plant-based options directly adjacent to the conventional animal product options in the refrigerated section. So, you know, today consumers can find their plant-based milk right next to their animal-based milks, get all the kinds of milks they, they want at the same place, drives trial. And this didn't really even start until the 2000s with silk. So that's plant-based. The next category is fermentation, which is defined as the use of fungi, bacteria, and other microbes to process food. We've been using this technology for millennia for beer, bread, kimchi, tempeh, cheese, and, and much, much more. And we're now leveraging fermentation in a more technical and precise way uh, in three primary categories. The first is traditional fermentation. The second is precision fermentation. And the third is biomass fermentation, the first two of which are relevant for dairy. Um, or most relevant for dairy. So traditional fermentation is just the use of microbes to bioprocess ingredients into end products like cheese. So uh, companies like Miyoko's and Treeline are already using fermentation of nut creams to create their cheeses, just like we would use microbes uh, on cow's milk or goat milk or whatever to create traditional cheeses. And I expect that we're going to see a lot more innovation here with different uh, combinations of microbes with different novel plant sources. And we're going to get uh, totally new waves of, of cheese and dairy products. The other category I mentioned is precision fermentation, which refers to the use of microbial hosts uh, as kind of like cell factories to produce uh, functional ingredients like proteins, enzymes, flavorants, fats, pigments, etc. You know, Impossible Foods is heme uh, produced from a yeast is, uh, you know, kind of gives it that iconic bloody flavor and, um, and taste and, and uh, you know, Companies are applying the same strategy in dairy now. Uh, so perfect day, legendary, new culture. Th there's maybe 10 or 15 people uh, in the precision dairy fermentation space are, are pursuing the production of casein, whey, dairy fats, and other functional components of, of milk produced via microbes in, in a really precise way. Um, I think one, one thing that's, that's interesting to point out is that we're already using this technology to create the, the majority of, of modern animal-based cheese. So, you know, we used to get the coagulant rennet from the stomach lining of, of calves, and we now produce basically the functional equivalent of that through fermentation. And so you, if you eat traditional animal cheese, you're probably eating, eating uh, a product of this already. And just maybe a, a few really quick case studies to make this more concrete. The first being Perfect Day, formed in 2014, was really the first company to make real milk proteins uh, for food applications using microbes. In late 2018, they first commercialized uh, their ingredients with a joint development agreement with a uh, global agri-food company, Archer Daniels Midland. And in 2019, they received the, their first FDA approval and uh, have been starting to sell products through um, partnerships like with the Urgent Company and with Smitten Ice Cream. Uh, as early as is early in, in 2020, and uh, they they've raised a considerable 360 million dollars so far. Uh, expect to start seeing a lot of their products on the market. Uh, many, many companies like Change Foods are not are not pursuing ice cream as a good market strategy, but are going after cheese because it's kind of like the I think someone earlier said final final frontier of plant based. There's only about three percent market penetration there, and despite being a really high value product. Um, I think cheese is, is going to be really big for, for fermentation. There's also uh, breast milk. Uh, there's a couple of companies, at least Helena and Harmony, that are producing human breast milk proteins via fermentation, which is just a really high value, high value use and great go-to-market strategy. And then um, ultimately, you know, the, the goal is to develop milks that can be as functional and versatile as the animal-based version. Not a lot of companies are explicitly using fermentation to go to market with milk because of the low, I think, low price point right now. But I'd imagine that that's in the, the long-term go-to-market strategy of many companies. Now, lastly, to using um, animal cells to cultivate milk, the, the kind of the third bucket. In case this is new to you, it might be helpful just to briefly introduce the, the concept of meat cultivation, which has its roots in both uh, biomedical tissue engineering, so like growing organ replacements, as well as uh, medical microbial fermentation, like producing human insulin in yeast cells. Uh, in, to, to grossly oversimplify, cultivating meat is a form of cellular, cellular agriculture where we take a biopsy of animal cells, 
um, take them out of the body of the animal, bathe them in a soup of nutrients in a bioreactor as they grow in number, and then ultimately harvest the meat. Uh, there are now 65 companies at least dedicated to meat cultivation and one third formed in 2019 alone. It's growing really rapidly. And the similar approach can essentially be used to create cultivated leather, collagen, ivory, and other animal products. Um, and excitingly, it is now being applied uh, to produce mammary gland cells that can produce milk that is, uh, could be indistinguishable from, from the animal-based versions, but without, you know, without the animal. So there are two companies pioneering this approach, uh, both which formed in 2019. Uh, which, you know, they basically created this entire category of cellular agriculture, as well as an entire category of dairy products out of out of thin air. And the first company is Biomilk, uh, which I think you heard from the CEO, Michelle Eggers, this morning. They're based in North Carolina and raised a $3.5 million Series A round from Breakthrough Energy Ventures, which is uh, Bill Gates's climate change investment firm. And uh, then, then the other is Turtle Tree Labs which uh, is based in Singapore and has already raised $3.2 million in seed. So I'd expect um, uh, a lot of progress from, from this category and these two companies in, in the coming year. And uh, as I mentioned, both are pursuing uh, infant formula using, I think, hu human uh, mammary gland cells because of the really high, high value and price point. But we can apply this similar technology to really producing um, anything. Uh, in, in, in the interest of time and also due to my lack of understanding, I'm just going to gloss over the details of the production process here, but I believe generally this entails seeding mammary gland cells on a 2D scaffold in a bioreactor and then kind of purifying the milk components that are secreted into the, the 3D space, but not 100% sure. So how do these kind of three categories fit together? Um, ultimately, I don't think we see these categories as distinct, but rather as kind of one uh, one united alternative protein industry where we use, you know, products of fermentation, plant-based products, and and cellular agriculture cellular agriculture products, kind of all together here. Um, I'll just I know I've only got about two minutes here, um, so I will skim through a lot of this here, just kind of showing where we're at in terms of sales, um, the primary drivers of of what what caused purchase behavior. Um, and just point out that there's steady growth both in the U.S. and in global markets. We're already, uh, especially in key global markets like uh, Asia Pacific, just 66% volume share of plant-based. And um, you know, the if you, you zoom out for for 10 years globally, the compound annual growth rate of plant-based dairy is about 10%. That seems really high, but I, I really do expect that sales are going to radically accelerate as this kind of new generation of plant-based cultivated and fermentation-enabled dairy products that have really unprecedented functionality, could have lower price points, uh, become available in the coming years. And a lot of the, the really exciting pioneers who are going to drive this next wave are uh, part of this conference. So it's, it's an honor to be here with everyone. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And uh, yeah, here are some of GFI's free resources if you go to gfi.org that, that we hope are, are helpful to any of the audiences who could be here. You're also free to uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. My name is Nate Crosser, if, if I can be of assistance.